Hello, and welcome to this session of ALM, Automation Layering Masterclass. Today, we're going to talk about what to do when you have hundreds or even thousands of products in your merchant feed, and you want to get the best possible results for advertising these on Google Shopping or on one of the other search engines. There are techniques where you can take advantage of Google's automated bidding, but still get more control over which products show when and how much profit you end up making. So that's the automation layering component. And today on the show, we have Simone Pardini, who found out how to do this, and he's going to explain to us what techniques can get you the most benefits. So let's get rolling with this episode. Simone, welcome Hi. to the show. Thank you for joining us. Tell us a little bit yeah, about uh, who you are, what you do, and uh, where you're calling us from. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as you say, I'm Simone. I'm uh, by name. You can you can probably tell I'm Italian. Uh, today I'm calling from Italy, although I live in Spain, uh, in Barcelona. But like today, I'm here uh, just calling from Italy. Uh, just this terrible. <laughs> yeah, Barcelona, beautiful city, and uh, in Italy, I think you're in Tuscany right now, so I'm sure you're enjoying some lovely uh, Tuscan wines. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like a lovely, lovely wine and lovely food as well. Nice, nice. Um, hey, and so you've been doing PPC for uh, for a while now, and you were an ex Googler working with the agency team. But but briefly, take people through like what makes you uh, an expert here. Yeah, so as you say, yeah, since uh, I started, since the beginning of my career, I, I worked with, uh, in PPC, mainly with Google Ads. And uh, so I worked for corporations. As you say, I was an ex Googler, I, I supported agencies, and then I started freelancing uh, during COVID. Um, the reason why I started freelancing is because I thought that there was so much out there that could be offered in terms of custom solutions for different clients. And, um, and uh, especially because I loved working with e-commerce mainly. So by doing freelancing, I'm really able to work with the business I like and I'm able to deliver custom solutions. So this, this is the reason why I started freelancing lately. Nice. And I love that custom solutions, right? So let's talk about that. So it sounds like the last couple of years you've been focused on e-commerce clients and the traditional campaign structure that you see with shopping uh, clients is people will divide the product feed by category and put all the products from a certain category in a shopping campaign or a different performance max campaign and that's sort of where they end uh, but it sounds like you found a way um and we've seen that way as well but, but you you go ahead and explain it like what's that way that you can actually do it that structuring a little bit better Sure. Yeah. As you say, um, most of the campaign structures are based on collection. So there is maybe a, like in the best case scenario, there is a one campaign for each collection or sub collection, but everything really ends there. Google really uh, does most of the job already with the automated bid strategies. I mean, if we talk about target ROAS, um, this algorithm is already uh, well designed to push the uh, products that are likely to deliver the best results. However, there are some additional information that Google doesn't know, such as the product profitability, for example, or um, some additional information in terms of stock, like a client may have a lot of stock for certain items that they need to push because they need to sell and reduce their internal costs. So, of course, Google doesn't have this information and we need to provide Google with this information in order to make really the best out of the investment that advertisers are doing on Google Ads. So uh, the idea here is to label the products uh, into the top performing products and uh, run an internal analysis based on the product performance and basically label these products according to several factors. I mean, use a different set of rules to assign the uh, basically identify the top performing products, the low performing products, and all the 
uh, average performing products that are in the middle and uh, assign different labels in order to be able to give Google additional information on what to push, what to advertise, where to invest most of the money in order, again, to make the most out of the investment that the advertisers are doing on Google. That makes sense. And so there's a couple of steps involved in this, right? It sounds like step number one is figuring out based on the business drivers of the company that you're working with, what is the ideal campaign structure and what are those divisions? And so you've mentioned things like conversion rate, profitability, seasonality, inventory levels. These could all be factors. Um, and so step one would be figuring that out. Step two would be labeling your merchant feed. And step three would be making sure that based on those labels, the products continuously get allocated to the correct campaigns. Um, exactly. Is that how you think about exactly. it? Yeah. Um, and so now, now you did have some sophisticated ways of doing this division, right? And I think you were talking about having some neural network technology to do the, uh, the clustering. But tell us a little bit about uh, kind of the, the different clusters and the different labels that you decided to attach to products. Yeah, so um, there is a lot of hype around this point right now about uh, product labeling. Um, there are like different uh, different point of views on this um, on the on this approach. There are a lot of people that uh, label the products according to the product performance, such as conversion rate, number of transactions, return on investment. But I found that a little bit limiting in a way because uh, this approach doesn't take into account the seasonalities. So basically what I did was to add additional information, again, uh, product profitability, so something that we discuss with the client, as well as the daily performance of the product. So what I do through Optimizer, of course, is I, looked at, I look at the product performance uh, on a daily basis in the last 90 days and then according again to different rules these products get labeled as the top products in the last 15 days or the top products in the last 30 last 60 or last 90 days so by dividing their products by using these um the daily performance as well we kind of account for seasonalities because the idea is if a product has been selling well in the last 7 or 15 days it's very likely that this product will keep on selling well at the same sales velocity in the next 15 days as well. Instead, if a product was in the top products, but in the last 90 days, there is a certain likelihood that the seasonality of this product has passed. For example, uh, let's consider a, a business selling paddle boards, for example. So paddle boards, at least in, in Europe, uh, is a product that is highly seasonal. So we sell paddle boards in summer. Uh, and if we assume that the same advertisers sell other products as well, the pad when we are in October, the paddle boards probably will be labeled as top 90 days. And we won't allocate as much budget as the products labeled as top 15 days. Of course, we still want to spend money on paddle boards because maybe people will still buy it but we want to spend less budget on it and we want to be a little bit narrower with the targeting. So we can adopt a different target ROAS to narrow down the targeting, narrow down the market and still have a decent ROI for, for these products that are uh, out of season. Very cool. Yeah, I love how you do like multiple date ranges to see sort of that waning seasonality um, and slowly ramp down without completely turning it off. Now, the, uh, what do you do about products that may not be getting a ton of data or low-performing products? So um, uh, this has been really the major challenge because it's kind of easy to identify the top-performing products but and it's kind of easy to spend money on the top-performing products. But how do we identify the products that are perform as average or don't have enough exposure? And how much money do we need to invest on these products? What is the target ROAS that we need to set on these products? So, so the idea was to label all the underperforming, all the uh, products with low exposure, so products that respond to certain characteristics that are generally products that receive less than 10 clicks or less than 10 impressions. Okay, So 
label all these products and put them into a separate campaign with ex extremely low target ROAS and spend some budget on these products in order to run some tests. Of course, if these products start getting transactions, then will be labeled as top 15, top 30, top 60 days. And over time, the number of products with low exposure will reduce and the number of products labeled as top will increase thanks to this, to this strategy. Yeah, that makes sense. And so what you basically are doing is provide fluidity. A product doesn't have to get stuck with one label, but it can always evolve. Um, and as you said, if it's something... With yeah, no that, absolutely. So products really jump from a label to another uh, according, to, uh, according to how often the analysis is done. Uh, and this is really, this is the beauty of this because we don't really have to manually change things. We need to run, uh, for, uh, we need to run a good analysis on the products. We need to understand what are the best products. And this is like the most time consuming part. Then once this is done and the analysis is performed on a daily basis, then products will jump automatically from a label to another. And, uh, and by using the, Google Ads algorithm, then the performance is optimized because, again, we will spend most of the money on the pro on the products that are labeled as top 15 days, which are, will deliver the highest ROAS, which will target the highest highest market possible. So the investment is really uh, surgical in a way. And the other part of the investment is to test new products. Right. And this would, of course, be very difficult to do manually. So I think the secret sauce lies in what is the grouping that you do. Um, so you've explained what you do, but it could be different for different clients or different scenarios. And once you've got that figured out, then the trick becomes how do you get this done on a daily basis or even more frequently without having to do it manually. Right. And so that's why we're talking about automation layering. Um, and that's where tools like Optimizer then come in. Um, and I believe you were using another tool called what is it? Uh, tracker, uh, catcher, catcher, catcher. Right. So, so now you yes. you basically use these tools to put the, the right labels in the product feed. Um, so, talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, sure. So, um, so the the optimizer is really the key is the is the key tool because uh, it allows to do these analysis automatically on a daily basis based on a set of rules that are pre-configured and then once the analysis is done on a daily basis then all the analysis is output on a spreadsheet automatically and then this spreadsheet is then linked to the merchant center where the labels are applied of course as you say doing this analysis manually that would be that would be impossible because uh if we talk about a business like a yeah a business with 2,000 different products. Running these analysis on a daily basis probably would mean that eight hours a day are spent on doing this analysis. But instead, with Optimizer, this is done overnight and is automatically applied in the merchant center, which is really the beauty of that. That's then great. by using the custom labels, we can create the, the shopping or performance max campaigns and everything is automated there. Yeah. Uh, I think you've actually taken the, the tool capability one step further. So we have some baked in capabilities in the in the shopping automator that will let you set basic conditions about grouping things by ROAS, for example. But it sounds like you've taken it one step further by using the rule engine so that you can start really customizing. And that's where the secret sauce and your value add comes in, right? So if people want to work with you and figure out like, hey, what, what's, uh, what's Simone's way of grouping things? Um, that does require a little bit more sophistication and that's where the rule engine comes in. So that's really fantastic to hear that you've, uh, you've taken the tools sort of to the, the limit of what they can do and, and drive performance with that. Yes. Yeah. As you say, um, the approach is totally custom really because every business is different. And again, uh, many businesses have problem with stock. Um, many times the stock means, uh, extra stock mean extra costs. Mm -hmm. or like uh, mm, the uh, every product has a different margin so we need to take this into account when we run the analysis and that's why that's why it's so important to have discussion with businesses really also yeah. um, you mentioned catcher earlier i mean the fact that with optimizer we can create these custom labels like 
top 15 days, top 30 days, is really helpful because it helps to drive performance uh, across different channels as well, across different campaigns, not only performance max and shopping campaigns, which are most of the time the uh, main drivers of performance, of course. But if we basically, if we use Catcher, we can download the merchant center data into a Google spreadsheet then that we can then use to build DSA feeds. And then we can build a DSA campaign using the top 15 days only. So we can invest money on search through a DSA campaign only top only on the top performing products. So that's really nice. That's why I'm saying that optimizing is at the core, and then Catcher really helps to expand the targeting. Nice, I love that. It really taken uh, automation layering to heart there. Um, so okay, so we've talked about like figuring out what are the groupings, how to put on the labels. Uh, let's talk briefly, though, how do you make sure that the campaigns are constantly in sync based on the labels as they keep evolving? Uh, obviously, that's not yeah. something you do manually, right? So talk a little bit about that. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. No, no correct. Uh, good point. So uh, still, this is done through Optimizer. Uh, the, uh, it was the old campaign refresher. Can't, can't remember the name now. Is like a dish campaign yeah, manager. Open yeah. campaign automator, I think. Uh, Yes, shopping okay. campaign automation. So basically, it's a future in built in optimizer that on a daily basis refresh the ad groups and the asset groups inside each campaign based on the uh, merchant center feed. And of course, the feed is updated on a daily basis. So whenever there is a new ad group to be added or new products to be added into a new campaign, this is done automatically on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. It depends on how we set it. But yes, good point. Is that, is that yeah, so like a lot of customers they use the the shopping campaign uh, builder and automator tools to to basically say, okay, we have a new product that was not in the feed yesterday, but it is in there today. And then through our tool, you've specified what is the structure. So when do you need a campaign? When do you need a product group? When do you need uh, an ad group? Depending on whether you're using exactly. Emacs, right? And so then it knows, okay, this new product logically fits in this place. And then it creates a new campaign, a new ad group, a new product group, whatever is necessary. But what's cool about what you've done is not just about new products. It's about existing products that now have a different label because all of a sudden they went from low volume. We didn't know anything to what you said. All of a sudden we boosted the volume and it's a top 15 product. So it gets moved into the correct structure. Um, and it's automatically running and it's taken care of for you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, one additional thing is that uh, if a new asset group gets created into a Pmax campaign, then still in Optimizer, I've got the notification that maybe that new asset group is missing the audience signals. So I know that I need to go into the account and I need to add all the assets and all the audience signals. This is something that needs to be done manually, but at least I've got the notification that I need to do it. Yeah, great. Um, okay, so you do all of this hard work. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, results. Uh, so clearly you've been doing this for a while, so it must be paying off. So let me pop some numbers uh, on the screen and talk us a little bit through what you've been seeing. Yeah, so uh, these are the uh, results of these labels in the last 90 days. Basically, what we can see here is uh, that most of the conversions are actually happening in the products label as top 15 days. So like the vast majority, so 409 conversions are in the last 90 days have been driven by this top 15 days label. And uh, the second top performer is the top 30, top 60, and top 90. So basically, as we can see here, these uh, top 15, 30, 60, 90 days work as, as they should. So most of the conversions are happening here, and then there is a gradual reduction. Um, if we look at the cost, we have really the same, the same, the same graph. I mean, most of the cost has gone here in top 15 days, top 30, top 60. And then we have products that are not labeled. So as I said earlier, uh, products that are not labeled or low exposure are the uh, products where that we, can, we can't really determine if they are good or bad. So we, need to, we still need to spend some money on those to understand uh, 
to, to be able to label them correctly. Uh, if we look at the conversion rate, we still have the same results. Probably here between C top 60 and top 30 days, they're inverted, but the results are very similar. So, uh, I mean, from my point of view, this is the proof that if we label the products correctly, if we identify the top performing products in the last 15 days and we keep on spending money on those, we really reduce the money wastage and we increase the results. We increase the return on investment. We invest on money with the highest conversion rate. Uh, let's, have a, let's have a look at ROAS. Okay. So here we have similar, again, similar graph inverted between top 30 and top 15 days, but that's another point of view. But again, the vast majority of the, of the conversions, the vast, the vast majority of the, of the revenue is, com is coming from these top 15 days products. And of course, one of the things that maybe be glossed over a little bit is that as you've put in place uh, different campaigns for top 15, top 30, you can set different budgets for them. You can have different uh, bid strategies. I mean, even if you're doing target ROAS for all of them, you can have different targets. And so that's what affords that flexibility where you're connecting your business goals with uh, the Google ads automations. So that's really what gives you the power to, to steer the performance and the results in the direction that you want. Exactly, exactly. And again, if we know that the products labeled as top 15 days are going to be our best products, we will spend more money on these products. So we'll allocate more budget on this campaign and we will set a lower target ROAS. So we will allow this campaign to spend more money, find more potential customers based on these top performing products. And instead, if a product is labeled as top 90 days, we set lower budget and higher target ROAS. So we limit, we limit the money wastage on these products. Very nice. Well, Simone, this, uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you for sharing how you do this. Um, now, you said you're based in Spain, you're originally from Italy, but you work with customers from pretty much all over the world, right? If anyone wanted to. Hit. Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. Mainly, I work with uh, businesses in, in the United Kingdom, uh, but I work with uh, businesses as well in Australia, United States, so all the English speaking countries. Okay, great. Uh, now, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best place to find you? Uh, on LinkedIn, uh, that is probably the best place, uh, even because I'm always connected on LinkedIn. So if people write me, um, I can answer straight away. Great. Simone Pardini from Pardini Consulting. So uh, we'll put that URL, the LinkedIn profile in the show notes. But uh, Simone, this has been great. So thanks again for sharing. Thanks everyone for watching and learning about automation layering. If you want to keep learning more about this, we have new episodes coming all the time. Hit the subscribe button there at the bottom and we'll keep you notified whenever we have a new episode. But thanks again for watching. Thank you, Simone, and have a great day.